A friend who was driving, she must have fallen asleep at the wheel for like, I don't know, 30 seconds. But that 30 seconds, the car just done a complete spin. And I remember I opened my eye and saw the car spinning towards the bollards that was at the side of the road. And then she just must have woken up and then put the brakes on. So the car's now s screeching and I'm just seeing this bollard Getting closer. Getting closer and thinking that that was going to be the end. And I remember just praying and saying, please, 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 please save us, please save us. <laughs> and then the car just stopped. And the bullard was just right there. Assalamu alaikum, sis. Wa alaikum salam. Jazakum Allah khair for coming through. Barakallah feek for inviting me. Welcome. Um, so before we get into it, we'd like to ask obviously all our guests that come, just give us a little background about yourself just to get us started. Um, so you want me to go back to when where? you like, your name, <laughs> where you're from. Okay, so, okay, my name's Amina. Um, I'm born and raised in Croydon. Um come from a Caribbean household, Caribbean background. My mum's Jamaican. Um, my dad, my real dad is from St. Vincent. And I have six siblings altogether, three brothers on my, between my mum and my stepdad and my, on my dad's side, I've got two sis, um, one sister and two brothers and um, another brother who is from my stepdad. As in, like his previous, yeah, before he married your no, mom. As in, that's complicated. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll leave that one there. Yeah, but um, as as for your growing up, then obviously you said about your father and your stepfather. I'm guessing from an early age, they separated, kind of thing. Actually, so when I so when as I was growing up, I didn't know that my stepdad wasn't my dad until. I was seven. Um, basically, the story goes that when I was nine months old, that was when my stepdad came into my mum's life mm. and they were together from then. Um, and obviously I I grew just assuming as a child would that's that that's dad. my dad. Of course, yeah. So I didn't know. Months. Yeah, I didn't know any different. Um, and he didn't come in between a house, say two, three, four, five? No, I didn't actually meet my real dad until I was 15 years old. For the, I met him for the first time when I was 15, randomly going to the shop to get some sweet sweet corn for Sunday dinner. And I don't think I bumped into him. I think I went past this barbershop and he must have been in the barbershop. And then somebody else pointed me out to him because they saw me go past the doorway. And then he he followed followed me out out the door. He followed followed me into the subway where I was walking mm. and introduced himself, basically. Yeah. It was random. That sounds like a like a storyline from EastEnders. Like I'm, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I'm your yeah. dad from. But how did he know how you looked? So someone else must have knew that he I knew, was. He knew who I was. He knew who I was. He so knew yeah. where we lived. I didn't know any of this because this is a kind of like a typical thing with Caribbean households. To be honest, like from my generation, a lot of people have had similar situations. Didn't grow up knowing their dad, and they they were kept away from that side of the family. So my mom kind of kept me away from, from that side of the family. There was a lot of reasons for that that I didn't find out until I was an adult. So growing up, I was always confused about how come I didn't know them. Mm -hmm. And obviously, like I said, if I go back to when I was seven and my mom actually told me whilst um, she was doing my hair one Sunday, was watching EastEnders at the time. And she actually said to me um, that, my dad was not my real dad. I'm going to keep calling him my dad because that's who course, I know to be course, my dad. Of course, of course, but just for the story yeah. to be understood, I'll get you, of course. Yeah, so... Um, and was there, have you ever asked her, like, was there a reason why on that day you said it? Like, sometimes as a parent, obviously you have to find the right timing for something. The reason why she actually told me is because being the inquisitive child that I was, I'd asked her a couple of weeks before that, how come my surname was different to my brother's? Because they weren't married at the time. So I had her name, which was her maiden name. And my brother had my dad's name. So obviously I've observed this 
as the seven year old. Of course. And I'm like, is it because the girls get the mum's name and is it because the boys get the dad's name? Like, what's what? How come my name's different? Yeah, yeah. And she didn't have an answer for me. So obviously, she must have, you know, dis- they probably discussed it. Mm. And then she told me that particular Sunday, which when I found out for me, that was like, I, I didn't understand. And it was actually, it's crazy because it was actually EastEnders that made me understand it because I don't know if you remember, this might go over your head yeah. but obviously the storyline, one of the storylines, there's this character called Sharon and she found out that her parents in EastEnders, Den and Angie, weren't her real parents. Mm. So it was during watching that episode, which was happen- must have happened like a few months later, that I twigged what my mum really meant. Mm. Because when she said it to me at the time, it was more like, oh, I don't have a dad. Mm. That was the first thing that kind of came to my head. I was like, so I don't have a dad. And then when she told me that this other person was my real dad, I couldn't put the dots together because I didn't know what he looked like. I didn't know who he was. No pictures, nothing. There was nothing. Mm. And then to be honest, as you would probably expect, I kind of forgot that she'd even said it. And it would come back to me momentarily during things like, I don't know, they would have an argument and I would overhear something that he might say. And then I'd be thinking about, why did he say that? And then it would come back to me. Oh, it's because he's not my dad. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that was that was quite difficult. And then when I met my real dad when I was 15, that was just another level of emotions because... He he just came, like I said, he came up to me quite randomly as I was going to get a tin of sweet corn. I'd been sent to the shop by my dad, yeah? And my dad, my, my stepdad, my dad was quite strict. Mm. So Timing go to the wise. shop. Yeah, go to the shop and come back in yeah. it. Don't be doing no detours. So I went to the shop to go and get the sweet corn. And then this guy's following me through the tunnel and he, and he said to me, oh, you don't know who I am, do you? And I was like, me being a 15-year-old, like cheeky, facey, I was like, no, I don't. So I <laughs> carried on walking because I'm like, I don't talk to strangers. Mm. So I'm carried on walking and he's like, I'm your dad. Something inside me kind of knew that he was going to say that though. It was weird because when he said it, I felt like this weird feeling of, oh my gosh, I actually know that you are, you're not lying. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and he yeah, yeah. started walking with me and he was talking to me for ages. And I kind of just was trying to get rid of him because I didn't want to circle all the way back to my house. After buying the sweet, he came with me into the shop to buy the sweet corn and everything. I'm walking around this shop. This man's just talking to me. And I, all that's in my head is, yeah, but I need to go home mm. and you're still here. <laughs> and I was just like, I'm going to get in trouble mm. because I'm looking at the time. Like, oh, time's oh. just ticking. Hour and a half later, I'm still out here in South Norwood. This man's following me around, talking to me and asking me questions. And I don't even want to talk to him. An hour and a half. Hour and a half. So when I got in, I finally got back to my house. I had to just walk back to my house and he followed me. And he was like, yeah, I'm glad I've walked you home because uh, tell you. And then he said to me, tell your mum and dad I said hi. And I was thinking, huh? I'm not doing that because yeah, <laughs> first of all, my mum hadn't really spoken to me about this whole situation a lot. So I didn't know details. I didn't know what was the circumstance behind it. I didn't know why I didn't know him or the family. I didn't have answers to questions. So I didn't know stuff that I found out later on as an adult. I didn't know that stuff back then. Mm. I didn't know that they all went to school together. Mm. I didn't know that. Even even your stepdad? My stepdad went to school with all of my uncles and, and my real dad. Mm. Like they all knew, they knew each, each other, other. Mm. from that generation. So the families knew each other. Yeah. And to add more um, salt in the wound, later on I found out that my grandmother, so my real dad's mother, actually lived like five minutes round the corner on the adjacent road, like for a whole year when we'd moved to South Norwood. She lived there and then, like, so we moved and she was around the corner for about a year and then she moved. I didn't know this. Nobody had told me this. I'm just and an I've Islamic perspective on that, sister. Though. So look, one is the name, you know. Uh, everybody has their lineage. Mm. You know, nobody can take somebody else's lineage and name that your brother had, you know, his dad's yeah. surname. And you you have to have yours 
and you can't take somebody else's, you know, it's it's kind of like a, yeah, a problem in itself. And then secondly, you've got ties of kinship, mm. which are very important to know because let's say, okay, you want to marry someone, you don't know that that person is related to you. Yeah. And they're living next door to you. Yeah. So that one angle is visiting them, being good to them because that's your grandmother and those are your relatives and your uncles and so on. So that's one angle. There is in coming into, you know, you want to marry someone, you don't know that that person is related to you. Mm. So there's a lot of angles. But what I wanted to know is look, at seven and then 15 and onwards, what did you emotionally feel? Did that have a, you know, impact on you in a negative way? Yeah, definitely. Because I, I think I, I carried a lot of anger um, for for several different reasons. Um, and later on was, it took a lot to kind of unpack all of what was really going on there. Um, but yeah, I was, I was re resentful. I was resentful towards my mum because I didn't know my, fa know that side of the family. And I didn't really understand why I hadn't been able to know. Like I've got a whole sister and two brothers over there. And then, <coughs> holy per cousins that side of the family is huge um and like you just mentioned like at any point I could have met one of my boy cousins and it could have got political it was it's actually that deep I went to one school and then about a mile away they were at another school so you know like this was quite a popular school in Croydon they were all in there all my cousins were in there the cousins that were a couple years older than me, same age and younger, they were all in there at the same time that I was in secondary school. So later on discovering all of that was really, it was a lot to get over because it was when I was then 30 years old that I met that side of the family, the, the whole family, my uncles, my cousins, everyone. So at that point in my life, I had kind of said to myself, um, well, I'm probably never going to meet these people, so let me just crack on. Because I'd gone through the whole of my life hoping that I would. Um, having people say to me, oh, I know your family, I'll introduce you. Um, at one point, I think one of my uncles had come around the house when I wasn't there. And he was like, oh, I want to, you know, get her to meet her cousins and stuff. But he never came back. The same with my dad when he actually met me. He had come and he was like, when he had come another time and he'd said, oh, I'm going to take you to meet your brothers and sisters your brothers and sister. And he'd given me like a little bag of stuff. Like it wasn't much, but there was some cream in there and there's a little badge. And on this badge, it had a picture of my sister and my two brothers. So I'd held on to this badge for a good couple of years, like hoping that I would actually get to meet them. And I never did. So then when I got to the age of 30, by this time I've got two kids. And I've, like I said, I've resigned myself to the fact that I'm not going to meet this side of the family. And then one day, because I was working in this hairdresser's in South Norwood, and the girl, that, the lady that owned the salon, she had gone to school with my cousins. And they just set up this whole meeting, like, unbeknownst to me. One day, one of my uncles just came into the shop and just introduced himself. And then half of my cousins came in the shop at the same time. And it was just mad overwhelming because it was a lot of things. I'm quite a, I'm quite a introverted person. So being introduced to like 50 people at one time that are my family. Overwhelming. Yeah. Cause there's altogether, my dad was one of 10. My real dad was one of 10. Mm. So I've got all these aunties. So it's a question on that, sister. So two things on that. One, in terms of, <clears throat> was it that from your dad's family side, that maybe they just didn't want to engage with you? Or was it more from the mum's side to say, look, you know what? I don't want her, my daughter, being with them. Which, which way was it? Because so, everybody's living close. So when I found out the tea, <laughs> when I found out the tea, the tea was that, my mum had been, um, so I said I've got a sister and two brothers. My sister's a year older than me. One of my brothers is the same age as me. So we can do the maths on what was happening, right? So my mum was disliked by my grandmother and my aunties and they made it clear to her. And so she'd been through some stuff with them. So I, when I, like I said, when I got the stories back from my sister my cousins that I was meeting they were telling me all this stuff 
they were filling in the dots and it was basically coming, you know, when I took it back to my mum and had the conversation with her at that point, she was like, yeah, well, I wasn't going to allow my child to be around people that don't like me. They did this, they did this, they did this. There was no way that I was going to leave you with them. And then there were some other sketchy things about a couple of people mm -hmm. that she just, she just didn't trust the situation in it. And she thought that it was best that there was no contact. Mm -hmm. And it's, the other point was in terms of your stepdad. So you mentioned, okay, you know what? Uh, he sent you to the shop to get, was it corn? And he wanted you back. Meaning what I gathered from that is, look, he has a sense of care for you, a sense of love for you. Be that through discipline and so on. Did you... Did you, did you feel that, that this is like my, my, my real dad? Yeah. Well, well, yeah, I mean, there was times when I didn't feel that, definitely. Um, we had a big disconnect. Um, he was, the, my, my dad was there for me as the father. And what, when I say that, I mean, like, Your he, stepdad, he, you mean uh, my stepdad, okay. my, I'm going to call him my dad okay. because so, for the benefit of the camera, when I say my dad, I'm talking about my stepdad. Okay. But um, when he, the relationship that we had was very much, um, it was very disrupt. It was, there was a lot. I'm just going to say that it was, it was a hard one. It was a hard one because growing up, um, he was the disciplinaire, but he was actually like my mum and dad had a very, ab there was an abusive relationship. I'm just going to say that I lived in a domestic violence household for a lot of years, um, witnessed a lot of stuff that kind of made me have this resentment and dislike towards him. Um, and then on top of that, you know, underneath, I'm saying to myself, oh, at certain times when he behaves certain ways, probably because I'm not his daughter. And that's, that was even my... Even though that might not be the case. Even though that might not be the you case. Understand. But it didn't take... It was, it was you know, later on in my life that I kind of, like, put all of that to bed, you know? Like, as a child, you carry these these thoughts and feelings that you're not, you're not able to kind of, like, regulate because there's no one to help you regulate it. There was nobody that was talking to me about the situation. I was working stuff out for myself. And there's only so much I can do when the information is limited. Do you know what I mean? So the thing is, my stepdad is is not here anymore. He's he died in in twenty twenty two January. Okay. He died from COVID. Um, in Allah, in Allah, in and he um, at that point in my life, I had not actually spoken to him for about a year. When he passed. When he passed, and that was um a that was very much a moment of regret for me but at the same time I was reconciling with myself things that I had gone through in my childhood which he was very much at the heart of so I had to have that distance the reason for the regret was because I recognized afterwards that he had been trying to make amends he had been very much trying to reach out. He at had older age? at my older age, you know, when I when I was like in my twenties and stuff and growing the kids, he very he didn't come to my house. He never came to visit me. And then the year before that, I didn't see him. He had been trying to come and you know visit us where I am now, which is quite far. When I was living around the corner for all those years in South Norway, didn't come. We didn't have that relationship. But I could see when I look back in hindsight, he was trying to make amends, he was trying to fix it. I think, you know, I was doing that work because I had held a lot of resentment. I had held on to a lot of the pain. And then I had grown past the idea that, ah, oh, it's your parents' fault. Yeah, there's things that happen and we can do the blame game or we can, take from the situation what happened to us and where it's brought us to how it's changed us how it's developed us how it's developed our understanding of the world and we can change it we can do something about our behaviors you know our attitudes we can change that going forward it and then use that as it. right and use that as something to aid other people um so 
that whole year that I didn't speak to or see my dad, that was what I was doing. And I had to do that. I needed to be able to do that. It wasn't only him that I kind of stayed away from. There was a lot of family that I stayed away from, to be honest, um, because I just needed that space. And I think it's important to say, look, every situation can be, there can be negativity inside it. Mm. It's how you use that to make it positive. Yeah. Companions had an upbringing before Islam. It's, you know, what they became afterwards and how they used those situations to better yeah. themselves. And also remember, stepdad or dad or anyone, sometimes people do things thinking it's the right thing to do. Yeah, exactly. And not knowing, you know, it's actually wrong. And that's where Islam comes in. Look, educate, have patience, educate, give them time, give them yeah. attention, give them love and teach them to change and so on. Yeah. 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 But moving forward in terms of, you know, so schooling was in, yeah, was it, uh, you, you want to ask more about schooling, upbringing and... It'll be a bit of a jump. I think let's try unpack maybe that convo because it might be a bit of a jump to jump from that all the way to school. When you're saying reconciling, do you did you look back and think, you know what, did it change from the time you was told at seven that he was your dad and prior to, meaning like the relationship you had with him before seven and after being told he's not your dad, did, looking back in hindsight, did you see in yourself a change in emotions towards him and vice versa now that maybe he now knows that you know do you sense that maybe I don't know he pushed away or he pulled in more because sometimes knowing something makes you behave in a different way rather than had you not known that kind of thing and vice versa I now that everything he... played a part in how you know how like I said how I looked at him how I looked at situations how I looked at the world um, it definitely impacted me and like I said, I was quite an angry teenager, but I was holding that anger in because there was nowhere to release that anger. Like I couldn't just, I didn't have the kind of parents that I could just be like these kids here these days throwing their weight around and, do you know what I mean, shouting at your parents. It wasn't that. Like my house was a strict household. Um, my mum was on it. She was strict. My dad was on it. Like people were getting licks. There was no way he was going to be running up your mouth. Um, there wasn't that balance between sometimes you have a dad that's soft or a mum that's harsh no, or vice versa. No, my mum was. My mum is is quite soft natured. But when she's ready, she's yeah, she's gonna. She's Jamaican. She comes. From, <laughs> you know what I mean? She's she's got that upbringing. So um, when you say Jamaican, is she like raised over there, Jamaican? Or yeah, she over? was raised over there. Okay. She came to this country when she was eleven. So she was raised... a sense of how over there works kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. She came to this country when she was 11 with her sisters. And her, you know, she, she was raised by her grandparents as well. So that definitely carried into how she, you know, parented us. Um, and my dad as well, he's, his upbringing was very similar in terms of that strict... But like he came from a very strict background. His mum didn't play games. But he was from St. Vincent, correct? No, that was my that's my real dad. Uh, okay. My my stepdad is Anglo Indian, so his mum was English and his dad was Asian. Hmm. Okay, like some mixed race. Yeah. yeah. Just one point, sister. So you know, like what your mum mentioned about the grandma and that side of the family. So important because sometimes you know, especially me dealing with marital issues and yeah. husband and wife. So mm -hmm. a relationship between a husband and wife should be separated between a relationship between, let's say, kids and parents. Mm. A person is a bad husband doesn't mean he's a bad father. A person is a bad husband, but the grandparents should not be connected or the uncles and the aunts because they all have rights. You understand? So sometimes I think we fall short on that regard. The husband is bad and I'm going to cut ties with all of his family, even though it might just be him. And also with, with the father, might be a bad husband, but you know what? Could be a good father. He's a good father and he's rights to his kids and so on. What happens with that is it has a big negative impact on kids. And it's something that we discuss constantly right? discuss, you know, kids with, they don't grow up with their fathers, especially the boys, but I think it's every boys and girls, but yeah, well, there, there's an impact in society. And yeah, there's definitely an impact in society. And I think for me, um, how that carried later in terms of, 
So I, I didn't I didn't actually become Muslim until I was you know, 31. So it was 2012. So I was 31. No, I was 32 in 2012. So at that point, I'd just like, been introduced to that side of the family. I knew them, but it was still early days. I was still getting to know them. That was a lot of territory to kind of unpack. Um, and so now in that, at that point in my, la- in my life when I became Muslim, I'd been in a relationship with my children's dad. So that was a long relationship. That was like a 10 year relationship. And I know that how I operated in that relationship was based off of what I, the learned behavior that I saw growing up, the impact of plus, plus compounded with the impact of not having a good relationship with my stepdad and not knowing my real dad. So all of that together definitely impacted how I operated in that relationship. And then after becoming Muslim, obviously there's things that you, you know, it's a journey. You learn as you're going along. You don't learn how to become a Muslim wife until you're in the situation. And even then there's a lot to learn because there's habits that you don't even know you've still got until certain situations arrive. Um, so for me, um, so I've been married twice and divorced twice. And in both of those marriages, I can see how the relationships or lack of relationships with my dad's dads and even my relationship with my mum, how that impacted on the way I operated in those marriages. Interesting, so just, um, so w- w- one thing in terms of something we, we, we had, a, well, we've had a discussion about, um, sort of ma- you mentioned marriage, maybe it'll come later on, and it's to do with maybe mosques, imams, or, or, or people themselves, there's a process of speeding up a marriage, and not, I'm not saying delaying, but not educating people what marriage entails. And I think you mentioned, I think to me that's solace. Yeah, mm-hmm. solace have a program. And it's quite important that people go through a similar program, if not with solace elsewhere, mm. they really understand what marriage entails. Because what's happening is sometimes, okay, we're coming from certain situations, which bring it straight into the marriage. Mm. Person new in Dean doesn't really understand what marriage entails in Islam or how to deal with certain compli- complicated situations. And then a year, two, three, four years, breakdown. Mm. So what, what do, you, do you think that's a a right approach that we should, you know, let's say mosques or imams should take? I think definitely it's, it's, when I did the Solis program, I was very impressed with the, the way that the, the way that the course is laid out, it makes you, it's, it's, it makes you focus on your own stuff, it makes you focus on what you're bringing to the table and what you need to still work on. So I think in terms of mosques and, you know, bringing it into the community, it's definitely something that we need to do more work on. But at the same time, if the person doesn't think they need to do work, then they're not going to. So I think there there actually needs to be more awareness about people adopting more self-awareness. And because when you're, when you're in a marriage, You have, everyone goes in with this romanticized idea. You have this expectation in your head that it's going to go like this. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Khadija. It's what everyone wants, Mm -hmm. okay? They want that love story, you know? They want that ideal. But the reality is that everybody, like you said, everybody has baggage to some degree. Everybody has things that they bring into the marriage that you're not going to see until later on. It's all good when you're first talking and, you know, that's that, you know, honeymoon period or whatever not, and everybody's in their feelings. And then later on, when, you know, your husband's leaving underwear in the bathroom floor, leaving the toothpaste cap off, or you, you know, you're, you're, you're not getting the dinner cooked on time and, 
the house is untidy and the cat's litter tray is smelling and it's it's annoying your husband, things like that. Just, you know, I'm I'm saying random stuff yeah, that probably these isn't are, These even, are what the things that, well, I wouldn't say they're the main things. But they're, they're not main things, they're, the they're little things. things. They're, 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 but that's that reality. But I yeah, remember one brother telling me, he said, listen, I got married. I didn't know I was going to be a driver. <laughs> <laughs> driving to here, kids, driving, right. you know, picking up the shopping, picking up. Mm. It's, it's a driving job, oh, it's a, it's a, it's exactly. True. And it's things like that that you're not expecting because you can't force. You don't foresee these things. Mm. And when you're asking questions at the the interview stage, the meeting stage, these aren't questions that people think of. You don't. You're not. You're not fit. F- you're not foreseeing how that's going to go. Mm. But, you know, financials. You don't know how good somebody is financially if they are good at you know, looking after money, budgeting money. You don't know if, you know, sleep patterns. Do you sleep until mm-hmm. two o'clock in the you afternoon? Snore. Do you snore, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, these are things that people don't ask questions about, but they're the real things that will get on your nerves later on down the line and then build up resentment. Mm-hmm. And it's the resentment that you then have to unpack for yourself because you have to ask yourself, what is triggering you? What is it in this situation that's triggering you about that person's behavior mm. and why? Mm. And I think we don't want to, <laughs> you want to make your marriage podcast, but I think also <laughs> the level of tolerance, mm. because the messenger spoke about this. He said, you're going to marry and you're going to see in your spouse shortcoming and negativity. Try and get the good Overlook them and look at the positives because yeah. everybody brings shortcomings, but people bring Positives. Yes. Okay, look, he, he, he pays the bills. He looks after the kids. He helps in the home. He's doing this. He's a Muslim. He's praying. He's fasting. Doesn't smoke. Doesn't take drugs. There's still a lot of tick boxes. Yeah. But sometimes what happens now, especially with youngsters, they'll see one little thing and that's it. Mm-hmm. And I can't tolerate this. I can't accept this. It has to end. Yeah. So that, you know. They might even see one thing that's probably even, let's just say, even big. But then they'll pick on all the small things every single day. You go, I'm not going to pick up your clothes or I'm not going to. And then you have consistent battles and all the time. But in, in that anyway, with regards to, like you said, obviously two marriages and then two divorces, do you, like you said, when you're looking back again in the hindsight, and of course, this is a podcast to teach so that hopefully other people don't make the same mistakes and they learn from it, whatever, whatever. Are there points that you can say, you know what, for other sisters and even brothers that you think because you linked it to not having your father figure there and even the one that you did have there, that kind of, uh, you know, um, ups and down kind of relationship you had. And then obviously that led into your marriage. Mm. So what would you say are the kind, was it that insecurity? Was it the, maybe, I don't know, the lack of love maybe you felt from your dad and maybe not seeing your other real dad? Then that pushed you into that situation with new husbands and saying, maybe I don't need them or was it the independence? Like, could you connect it to some dots to say, you know what, this led to that kind of thing? So I'm trying to like think because it's a, for me the answer is so loaded. But um no, it's fine, I'm packing, inshallah. I know that when, for example, when I was with my children's father. This is prior to Islam now. Prior to Islam, there was an insecurity that I brought from that relationship into other relationships so the man the man was cheating on me Mm. he was like so that for me brought up a lot of problems for me with my self-esteem with my self-worth and I had a huge lack of confidence for a long time and so it took me a while to build back up my confidence so then when I did get into marriages I was there was definitely a level of insecurity in terms of feeling a level of abandonment. Mm. What I didn't recognize was that feeling of abandonment was even before Before my children's father. So that feeling of abandonment, feeling of neglect connected to the low self-worth in a, in a, in a conversation about, why is this person commenting on your Instagram post? I'm being triggered by something that's so minor and irrelevant because it's creating a fear in my mind that security, this is gonna security. right. This is gonna lead to X, Y, and Z. I have to bring it up, but then how I'm bringing it up? I'm not bringing it up in 
a constructive way because I don't know how to do that because mm. I wasn't taught how to do it. I'm bringing it up in a in a, an argument. I'm bringing it up from a place of, so what's this all about? Mm. Which then immediately is obviously going to get the other person's back up course, yeah. if they're not doing anything. Mm. It's not them. I didn't make the comment. They did. Mm. And it's an Instagram page. It's not that deep. But to me, it is. Of course. Because it's creating an insecurity, but that's not, yeah, their problem the that's that's a me problem mm -hmm. that's a me problem so when it comes so i'm I'm just giving like a an example of okay. something that can it, it's a mountain that it's a molehill that can turn into the mountain mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and we have to be able to recognize it in the moment when it's happening mm -hmm. because later on that now can cause a different type of problem mm -hmm. or can lead to another set of problems so if for example, my husband don't want to talk about it. And then I'm now having, creating a story in my head that he's hiding something. Not realising it's just based on the last debate you lot just had. Or not realising that he doesn't even, it's not that deep and he doesn't want to talk about this because it's so irrelevant. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't communicate that to me either. Or he doesn't make me understand that there's no need for me to be insecure. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I mean? Of course, of course. There's yeah. a level of communication sides, because it's yeah. from both sides. Both sides. Because look, it's the Prophet Sallam walking with his wife, Safiya, uh, and uh, he sees two companions and he says, this is my wife. Mm. They say, Ya Rasulullah, can we, we're not going to doubt you. He said, Shaitan flows through us like the way blood flows. Namely, he's going to be inside giving you whispers. So to clarify that for communication, because at the same time, when you said that initial comment to me that, no, that's a problem. Why, why, why is a sister or lady commenting on a, because we deal with, we deal with those issues. Mm. Okay. But like you said, fine. It might be a professional comment. It might just be a like, but again, you know, so it's not completely, you would not be completely in the wrong if you're challenging it. Does she know you? Is it a professional comment? Did you reply? Did you respond? Reassure me. And then he reassures you, no, look at look at my response. I did respond. I just said, thank you. Fine, it's professional. It's work-related. It's a colleague or something. But it's got to be both ways, like you said. Because sometimes what happens is there is, the women get the, the shortcut from it. Yeah. And are, are supposed to tolerate and accept it uh, in all circumstances. But that's not correct also. There needs to be a level of kind of like you know, accountability both sides. And there does need to be a level of accountability both sides. Because even though that's fair, but I would also say that I know, because I know myself and I know actually how I reacted in that situation, what I what I needed to do was ask the question in a different way and not, and not approach the situation in a way that's going to actually provoke an argument because that's not the outcome that we, we need. If I actually need security, I need to voice that. If, I, if this is a, a moment of insecurity that I'm having for whatever reason, I need to explain that. And maybe even after I've explained it, maybe that person still is not going to acknowledge it. That's a different situation, you know, because there's a level of communication that needs to happen, like I said, on both sides. And both sides need to be open in terms of that um, emotional availability. We a lot of us go through life being very, very emotionally unavailable. So you will just shut down mm -hmm. when certain things are happening. It's easy to shut down. It's easier to shut down than to address what's happening at the time. Mm -hmm. And shut down, you know, like that can be even even more hurtful mm -hmm. to your partner. Mm -hmm. So when I say shut down, I literally mean like you just lock it off and you're just like, I can't be bothered, I'm not doing this. Mm -hmm. Or at women who do regularly, because I know that was one thing that I used to do was I'd not talking to you for, for days. Mm. And I know that upsets men. So that was the re that was why I used to do it, because mm. I know you're going to be upset by it. I've tried to address an issue with you and you're not hearing me, so I'm just not talking. Mm. I'm not going to talk to you about nothing. Mm. But that doesn't help. Of course. It perpetuates another problem. Mm. This is what the Prophet something said about the three days, you know, that you shouldn't go longer than three days to... And I get that, you know, sometimes you do it with your friends or whatever, you think I'm going to speak for two days, three days, but that three days turns into a week. And by the time you have to have that conversation, it's now become a massive conversation on top of that emotions, because you've left me hanging for how long, which means you don't like me. You must not really love me. When it could have just been a single five minute conversation that you could have just had mm -hmm. and forgotten about the day after. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have that story also with a man that the Prophet said about, 
uh, you know, the next man that comes out of that and in will be in Jannah. And they, they said, you know, what, what is it about you that allows you to be in Jannah? It just says, look, every night when I go to sleep, I don't have any, any yeah. you know, and um, grudge or anything like that for anyone at night. And when you think of that feeling, like it's very hard to actually understand that, but it's a hard thing to actually do. Yeah. If you have a wife, if you have kids, you have brothers, sisters, business, whatever you have, everyone's going to get on your nerves somehow. So to go every night sleeping, knowing you don't hold any grudges for your wife, for your yeah. dad, for your bro- that's a very hard thing to do. And I think that's a, f- it's definitely a thing that many of us, uh, probably lack and that comes under the you know when we spoke about having the emotional intelligence of today is very poor you'd think in a, in a time of such information mm. hadiths everywhere everyone can research look at the quran meanings that you would have a level of emotional intelligence but it seems like the people of the past who had lack of that had more of that meaning in a sense they had lack of information but they had more sincerity they had yeah. more emotional intelligence to be like, you know what, when to be soft, when to be harsh, when to... We don't seem to have that in today's marriages. And I think we've spoken about marriages a lot. That That is probably one of the biggest things. And that's both man and woman. I don't think it's just necessarily a man issue or a woman issue. Like You do hear of sad stories on both parts and both parts feel like they're the victims. You don't even hear of a man saying, you know what, actually, I was the bad person and I'm the... Or the woman saying, you know, actually, I was the... Both people will act like... Everyone's blaming each Exactly. Other. No one ever puts their hands up and just say, you know what? I was the bad person. She was great. She done everything. I left for my reasons. And the woman says, you know what? I was great. Oh, you understand? So, yeah, there definitely does need to be a level of uh, understanding oneself and, you know, taking self-accountability, which, you know, we're all trying to uh, and go through. But I think we've, we've, we've discussed uh, a whole bunch of time on, uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a personal topic. But quickly then, just... Through your young ages, obviously, we were going through, you were seven, you found out your father. What was school like? What was your area like when you was growing up? School. Um, school for me was, I didn't get into problems at school, you know. Um, I was just a calm teenager. Life at school was good. In fact, school was a break for me from home. Mm. School was my, like, escapism because at home was very, like I said before, just um, Too many dysfunctional. Mm. And so going to school was escape. Like I could be with my friends or whatever, not in it. So mm. I enjoyed school. In fact, I really was upset to leave secondary school. And I went to college. And again, I enjoyed college. And I, I, I kind of moved out. Well, I didn't move out. I got asked to leave home at the age of 18. That was as a result of the relationship that I was having with my stepdad at the time, my dad. Because at this point in my life, now I'm 18. Now I'm getting a bit big for my boots and I'm voicing my opinion Mm -hmm. on certain things. And, you know, obviously in that dynamic, it was creating problems for my Mm mum. So... Because, you know, I would react to something that he does and I would say my opinion and I would say how I feel about it. And obviously he's not going to take that very well because I'm a, I'm a child as far as he's going like, I'm a child at like 18. Why, you, why have you got something to say? Mm-hmm. So for my mum, it was, he's bringing the argument to her now, like sort her out. <laughs> and then I'm saying to my mum, what do you mean, sort me, sort? What do you mean? Mm. This man's doing all kind of things, and you're coming to talk to me. Like she's just stuck in the middle. She was stuck in the middle, so she was like, "You're gonna have to move out and go and live with your auntie because this isn't working." And so, yeah, for me, that wasn't. Um, I didn't take that very well because I felt. I, I felt like that again was adding to the rejection and abandonment. So for me, going to using him over me, kind of thing. Right. Right. So for me, going to college and going to, you know, being out of the family environment was my escapism. Mm -hmm. And so when I left home, I went to go and live with my auntie, but I wasn't there for long. Um, And I ended up living with a friend of mine. um, And she obviously lived at home with her mum and her sister. They were actually close friends of my mum and my dad, but um, more my mum. So I stayed living with them for a little while. But that was when I now found the roads. 
Mm. I didn't find the roads in the same way that maybe a lot of the people in your podcast have talked about, but I found the roads. I found, you know, family. Mm. I found my, my peoples, a group of, you know I mean, my friends. And we were, you know, again, it was escapism because then I was doing the raving. I was, you know, drinking alcohol. I was, we was traveling and going and doing things and doing stuff that I don't really want to elaborate on. <laughs> Sorry, just a question. Uh, uh, mum and dad, were they religious, Christians? My mom, I had a, we, so we had a Christian background, but no one really went to church. It wasn't really that. I believed in God. I had quite a strong belief in God, but I never went to church like that unless it was like a christening or a wedding or something like that. What my nan drinking and stuff like that, would it? Yeah, yeah, they, there was alcohol in the house. My mum, my mum's mum, my nan, she was very religious. So all throughout my childhood, I would be staying with my nan at the weekends and she would take me to church. So I I always had this kind of like relationship with with God as far as I was concerned. And actually there was like an incident that happened when I was about 19, 18 or 19. We was we was coming back from this 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 um club and it was like five o'clock in the morning, it was raining hard. It was coming through Camberwell. And my friend who was driving, she must have fallen asleep at the wheel for like I don't know, 30 seconds. But that 30 seconds, the car just done a complete spin. And I remember I opened my eye and saw the car spinning towards the bollards that was at the side of the road. And then she just must have woken up and then put the brakes on. So the car's now screeching. And I'm just seeing this bollard. (laughs) Getting closer. Getting closer and thinking that that was going to be the end. And I remember just praying and saying, and then the car just stopped and the bullard was just right there everybody was in the car silent for about 30 seconds yeah and I just heard because everybody just went yeah because no one never had no seatbelts on (laughs) but you know that eight you said 18 so 18 you're quiet you know what now I'm mature yeah Uh, a lot of youngsters will start 13 14 they're hitting the roads by 18, 19, they're involved in certain things. Now, when you said 18, now you have a sense of kind of like moral guidance. Mm. What I can do, what I can't do, right, wrong, drinking, partying, smoking. So why why at that age to go down that direction? Because you don't, you said you enjoyed school, college and so on. Even though this, that was what I was used to seeing. Even though I grew up in a household which was pretty normal, that was what I was used to seeing. Like my dad smoked, people smoked around me, so it was it was a normal thing. Like everybody else smoked. I didn't start smoking until that age, to be honest. Yeah, until like eighteen, nineteen, and then even when I would go to the clubs and drink alcohol, I wasn't drinking like getting completely paralytic because. Mm-hmm. It wasn't something that I enjoyed, but it was there, you know, the alcohol and all of that was part of the environment. So, and then, like I said, growing up in this um, sort of Christian background, alcohol was normal. It was normal to see, you know what I mean? The uncles with the rum and the Coke and the brandy and whatever not, it was, it was normal. So for me, when I, um, it wasn't until I had my son actually, after I had my son at the age of 25, I decided for myself that actually I don't like this alcohol stuff. It's not something that I want to keep doing. And even at that point, I kind of stopped raving as well. I think I'd done it all like by that point. So by the time I was 25, I was like, okay, look, because when I had my son, I remember holding this little baby in my hands for the first time and just feeling the overwhelming feeling of responsibility. And so it was at that point that I kind of decided for myself that, right, well, we're not going to be doing too too much of the raving stuff. I think I must have gone out when he was about six months old and I I needed to get home. So I was just like, yeah, when's this, (laughs) when's this over? I just needed to get home. So I was like, I'm I'm not going to be doing this again. This is, I'm good. I'm good. We've done it. We've done all of that raving, 
Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know what I mean, till what o'clock in the morning, I've done it. I don't need to do this. It's boring, actually. Mm -hmm. So um, I stopped doing a lot of stuff. And then when I had my daughter in 2008, by that point, I was kind of like, like I said, I was in this kind of relationship where it was very, again, dysfunctional. And there was a lot of argument every minute because I'm finding out he's cheating with this person and then it's, it's a problem and uh, yeah, just madnesses were going on. So I needed to kind of like get back something for myself because I had lost me. I'd lost me because the the me that was in college that was, you know, more confident and I was, you know, I was doing this and doing that and I had a different whole persona. By the time I'd had my my son and then I'm going through this relationship where I'm just being treated like, you know what I mean? Like, I just was like, no, this isn't, this isn't how I'm supposed to be feeling. Mm -hmm. So I kind of took a step back and I started to kind of look at where my life was going. And I started to, I guess, become on a bit more of a truth seeking path at that point. And I'm seeing things happening in the world. And I'm, you know, I'm asking the big questions now, like, like what is this really about? Purpose of life kind of Yeah, questions. exactly. Um, and then I had this whole situation happen where I was at such a low point with the relationship. And I actually was like contemplating suicide. I was that low. Mm -hmm. So I remember this particular day it was like the day after we had this massive argue massive fight I'm not even going to say it was an argument because it was a fight mm. and I was like very I was just low I was just had no energy and I was like I want to go and go in the kitchen and I'm and, and just just end it because what what use am I to my kids mm. like I can't see any reason for me to still be here like no one cares this guy doesn't care no one cares like that was the thoughts I was having so I kind of had to I had to talk to myself and I took myself I remember I was sitting on my bed at the time and I, I I said to myself go and be with your kids go and sit with the kids I could hear the kids in the front room playing and you know just doing kids stuff watching cartoons or whatever not and I'm in here in the bedroom in this depression so I was like go and sit with your kids and I was bawling my eyes out so my face was my eyes were heavy everything was heavy I took myself in the front room just to be around their energy and I remember sitting down on the sofa in the front room at the time and I just closed my eyes and I was like like god please like I need something I need something right now I need a sign. I need something. And then, like, my window was on, like, the, the, this side. And I remember I had my eyes closed and I was crying to myself because I didn't want the kids to hear me, mm. but I couldn't hold back the tears. Mm. And so I just felt this warmth, like the sun moved in front of the, the window, but my blinds were closed. But the, the strength of the warmth from the sun as it moved in front of the windows was like at that moment it was it just felt like a hug mm. it just felt like I could hear Allah saying to me at the time I'm here I've always been here and I just kind of sat I just immediately started smiling and I just was like thank you and I called I remember I called the kids I was like, come in, come in. And I just called them over because I just wanted them to be in that moment with me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what's wrong, mommy? I was like, nothing, just come, just come. Mm -hmm. So um, it was at that point, I felt like I'd had an answer. I felt like I'd had this comfort that I was waiting for, for a long time. And then I just remember the next day, my whole attitude just was different. And I felt different. And I remember walking down the road, I had to go and, I don't know if it was the school run, but I was off somewhere. And as I was walking down the road, I saw this guy 
And he was standing up and he was, you know, like he was a Christian preacher. He was standing up and he was preaching the gospel on the side of the road. And he was talking to people. So he's called me as that. Do you believe in Jesus? And I was like, yeah, I do believe in Jesus, but he's a man. <laughs> and then I was like having this debate with him for about an hour on the road. And then he invited me to come to his church. So anyway, I remember I came to the church and there was a few other people that had come there and they was given their like testimony on coming back to Jesus and coming back to, and they was all saying, they was all saying what they were saying. And they kept saying this line, which was, you know, we thank Jesus. We thank, you know, thank Jesus. Jesus is in Jesus's name. And I was sitting there in the back saying to myself, I'm supposed to go up there and do this testimony. When I go up there, I ain't saying that because mm. actually I thank God actually and when I went up there that's what I did mm -hmm. so I was saying my bit and I was like yeah I thank God for guiding me back because I had this I told them the same story that I just told you mm -hmm. had this situation happen and I feel like you know God just gave me a hug that day with the sun just the warmth of the sun and you know I thank God and in God's name and I just feel like afterwards the coldest shoulder <laughs> <laughs> was what I received mm. because I did not get any kind of reception from any of them. Mm. And all the other people who had, you know, given their testimony were like, you know, they've been spoken to and welcomed in. And there was me over there with my two kids just standing there. So we left. I was like, come on, let's go. We're going, mm -hmm. we're not coming back here. Mm -hmm. And he was like, why not? And I was like, because we're not. Mm -hmm. And then it was literally about a month later, I, me I remember I, I was going to see my best friend at the time. And as I was crossing the road, I heard a voice calling me by my government name. And I turned around and I saw this sister, all nacarbed off, everything in black. And I'm looking at her, I was like, hi. And she's like, it's Stephanie. You know, Halima. It was Halima. So, and I'd known Halima from when we was like, 19 before she became Muslim it was actually Halima that was driving the car <laughs> the car story that I told you earlier okay yes, I don't yes. know she's gonna uh, want me to... lost for a few seconds speaking of the car the car story that I told okay, you earlier okay. so, so you, knew, you knew each other from young basically yeah 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 so um she called me and then she had like a, about four kids with her and I was like oh my gosh anyway we had a big catch up <coughs> and um then I remember she invited me around because I'm a hairdresser. My background is hairdressing. She invited me around to come and do her girl's hair and her hair. And um, she started giving me dawa. So the sister is very on it. <laughs> She's very, very on it. Mm. And every time I would see her, she'd be giving me dawa. And I'm leaving and I'm like, this, this girl thinks I'm going to become Muslim. You know, I don't know about that. Um, no. <laughs> but, you know, we plan the last, the best of planners. Mm. This one particular day, I've gone round to her house and she's put on the purpose of life. Yes. yes. That, and that 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 lecture has turned a lot of people Muslim. You know that <laughs> it's basic, but you know it's powerful. It, Actually, like, it everyone was powerful. That I see, not everyone, but a lot of reverts that I see, especially Caribbean as well. To be fair, is that that resonates with them. I, I think, don't know if it's how he speaks or how he articulates the whole story. All of it. I think articulation. He does three, speaks, and he does three, three episodes. Speaks. Yeah. No, there's three parts to it. Yeah, there's, there's three parts. parts. To it. Sorry, yeah, yeah, It's yeah. long, it's long, the original It's part. a long, it's like a whole, it must have been a conference or something because they literally mm. filmed it, broke it up into three parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the first part was enough for me. By the time I finished the watching it, I was, she was like, what did you think of that? And I was like, you know what? That was deep. Mm. And then we had this conversation. I remember specifically, it was a Friday. And when I had got to her house, her husband was getting ready to go to Juma at the time. So she put this thing on and I was watching it and it finished. And then we was having this conversation and I'm asking her a bag of questions, firing these questions at her. And then I asked her something that she couldn't, she couldn't answer. And then she said, hold on, hold on, I'm going to go ask my husband. So she went in the bedroom and then she come back out. She's like, he's going to come and speak to you. So he came, but he came to the hallway. He didn't come in the front room. And at the time, I'm thinking, why is this man not coming in the front room? But I was like, how's he okay, how's fine. How's disrespecting me like this? <laughs> no, I wasn't even thinking that. But I actually thought, awkward. okay, no, I didn't feel awkward. I actually thought, okay, that's 
It's quite, great. you know, that's commendable. That's yeah, because I saw what it was. You I saw, understood. Yeah, I understood. People don't see that. No, I understood like, oh, why he was. He doing doesn't it. want to shake my hand. No, no, no. I hand? understood why he was doing it. And I, I, at that point, I'd know. I knew about like free mixing and whatever okay, not. So okay, I kind of okay. knew, and I understood it. And I thought, oh, mashallah, you know. I didn't say obviously mashallah at the yeah, time, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I was thinking, oh, that's that's thing. yeah. So um, he stood in that hallway for the best part of at least two hours, giving me dawah. He didn't go to Jummah that day, and. Who's his brother? We know him, yeah? We I'll have to pull him up. But you didn't go to Juma, yeah? He was giving, he was, he was getting different Adja because he gave me my, he gave me the, the dawah that I needed and I took my shahada that day Inshallah. in the house with them, you know? Mm. So I do remember that uh, there's, there's a, you have a cousin. I think it's a first cousin mm. and she's a Muslim because she's yeah. been here. Uh, firstly, was she from the mom's side or the dad's side? And secondly, did you know that she was a Muslim and did she have any Impact on you? Um, she she's from my real so my, my biological father. She's from that side of the family. So yeah, I didn't meet her until I was thirty. Um, very close to her actually. She's one of the one of my closest cousins. Um, and yeah, she was. She I'd say that she definitely had some influence in terms of. I'd never had family who were Muslim before that. Um, but to be honest, my journey to Islam was very much my own, um, because I was doing a lot of like research in isolation, um, researching all different religions. So obviously I started back at Christianity because that was me going back to the church. And after the church, I kind of did all of that delving into, you know, the different religions, looking at. Okay, so what's Hinduism all about? What's Buddhism all about? What all these other things? I kind of went down the Kemet route for a little while and started doing the Pan-African thing. And I was like, yeah, this is not really, it's not really it. I don't know about this one. Um, is that all like before the whole meeting your friend again? Yeah, that was all before. Actually, the only thing I didn't research was Islam. I actually didn't research Islam. I actually researched everything else before meeting up with Halima again. Mm. Everything else, was that was the only thing I hadn't looked at. And I think in my mind, I had confused Islam with Sikhism. And I didn't really know there was much of a difference. And, and Hinduism. Like, or maybe it felt I mean, like an Asian thing. Yeah, I didn't really, like, I, I kind of, I just remember looking at Christianity, like I went into depth with that. Went into depth with Buddhism, went into depth with like, um, like I said, the Kemet stuff and the Egyptian stuff and and then kind of went down the rabbit hole and was looking at, you know, what's all this Illuminati business and the occult, what are they doing over there? And kind of was in that place of, okay, I'm just going to believe in God because Christianity is not for me. Buddhism's not for me. I'm just going to continue with my relationship with God and just pray, you know. That was it. And then I had that encounter with my friend. Mm -hmm. And that time you were 30, 31? You took Shada when you were 30, you said, was it? I was 32 when I took my Shada, 32. yeah. 32. Uh, what has been the challenges after Shahada? And what has been in terms of, you know, the things that you've enjoyed since taking a Shahada as a Muslim? I think the biggest challenge was kind of breaking away from the old life, the old habits, um, and adopting this, because it's a way of life, isn't it? It's adopting this dean, adopting what we we know in terms of, you know, bringing all the principles of Islam into your home and into your life. And that wasn't, I didn't find that very easy. Do you know what? To be honest, the easiest thing that I found to do was to put on hijab. Easiest. Yes. People, I know for other, a lot of other sisters, it's kind of the other way around. But for me at the time, putting on hijab was easy. I was, I, I put it on and I was like, this is, this is actually fantastic. Because what stopped for me was all of the attention, like the unwanted attention from men on the road. Um, because that actually genuinely irritated me a lot. I'd be pushing my buggy, I'd be with my kids, I'd be getting like, you know, just I, I, going past barbershops and just getting catcalled was something that 
genuinely bothered me. So when I put on the hijab and it kind of just stopped, I was like, this is great. Yeah, this is this is great. I like this. Because it kind of, it felt like, it felt like a a shield. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. And you, you, you know, you had uh, your sister Halima. Um, so was this support, let's say, from Muslim sisters, from the Muslim community? Or did you feel like, I've taken my shahada, I'm a bit on my own? I think when, so the first maybe six months was, you know, you, you're you're very kind of, you've got this zeal that you want to like learn everything. And I was going to talks. Halima was taking me here and there and she was introducing me to sisters. But because I'm that kind of person when it comes to female relationships, I've kind of always been on the back foot with them and kind of just kept people at a distance, females at a distance for a minute. Um, because I was like, okay, I have to take my time here with all the getting to know sisters because I didn't have that trust. Um, and sort of like after about a year, I think it was, it, I started to feel like I wasn't, I wasn't doing it properly. So I felt like there was three groups. So there was like, there's three groups around me. So there was like, Muslims, there was Asian Muslims who I didn't really feel like I could be part of that community. There was the like black Muslims who I felt were like really strict and I wasn't really ready to kind of go into that community like that. And then there was my non-Muslims, friends, family. So I kind of felt like I was in the middle there and I didn't know where to gravitate towards. Um, so I just say to myself, but the problem with that is that you need to have Muslims around you. You need to have righteous friends. You need to have people that are encouraging you, that are, you know, advising you and giving you the correct kind of nasiha in certain situations. Alhamdulillah, Halima has always been like that person that I can go to and speak to about certain things. So... I had a little transition like after the after a year where I got pregnant with my third child because I was still in that relationship from obviously before and I had to I I I had to leave that relationship not number 1 because it was haram at this point and number 2 because it just wasn't healthy anyway it was a, such a unhealthy environment for me to be in it was the reason why I was so low at that point when I was there. And it just wasn't making no sense. So I got pregnant and then I was like, what? I just genuinely was like, no, this, this, this is not it. And it was during that pregnancy, during the Ramadan, during the Ramadan while I was pregnant, that I left. I actually called Halima and I actually said to her, can I come and stay with you? And she said, yeah. So me and the two kids went around there and I stayed there for the last, I think it was the last 10 days of Ramadan. And we went to Tarawih. We did, you know, so many things together. And I'm, I remember making du'a when I was in the masjid doing Tarawih and saying to Allah, can you just make this situation easy, just rectify this situation because I, this is this is not where I should be. I, I just want this to, to end and please make it end easily. Um, and I'd sent him a message. I didn't, it wasn't like a long winded, oh, you've done this, you've done this. It was just literally, I need to leave because this isn't correct for me anymore. And I actually feel like I'm in a prison without walls. I'm, hun- I'm I'm genuinely unhappy. The end. It was very short, very concise, and that was it. He didn't reply. And I was like, am I going to go home? And then there's just going to be, like, dramas after this. But then, alhamdulillah, when I went back, he had gone. He'd just taken his stuff and left. And that was that. Was that. Mm. Alhamdulillah, because I just immediately was, <laughs> alhamdulillah. And I changed my locks and that was that. And we've we've got, um, now we have a good co-parenting relationship. We didn't for a while, but, you know, we've got to this place where we have a good co-parent relationship. He's not, it's not like I've 
I had stopped him seeing the kids because I never did any of that. And, um, you know, the kids still have their dad in their life. And that's that's really, you know, the best that it could have been, to be honest. Even that decision, would you say that's also linked to your kind of upbringing, knowing what it kind of done to you that you thought, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm going to let him have the kids? Definitely, definitely. Because I recognise how detrimental it is for both boys and girls to have both parents, regardless of whether they're together. And it's better if the relationship can be one where you you're it's harmonious and you can co-parent from, you know, a, a, a good place. Mm. It, it took a long time to get there, though, I'll be honest. Like, it took a lot of arguments and back and forth and whatever not. But alhamdulillah, you know. But you see the benefits and the fruits of them seeing their dad at least and then also seeing you. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, especially for my son. Um, my son's 19 now. And the only thing for me, like when you're talking about support, is that with my son, I feel like I didn't, I wasn't able to give him the support that he needed. Because obviously as a new Muslim, I'm still growing and learning the religion. I'm still breaking habits. I'm still developing new ones. And then trying to teach them the religion at the same time. There's no man in the household there's no islamic presence in that sense in the household for him and going to the mosque at that time he's nine ten i can't bring him on the sister's side so encouraging him to go on this the brother's side my son again is like me he's a bit introverted he's not he didn't he didn't enjoy that because he felt isolated felt like there wasn't any welcoming you know, no one was welcoming. And I'm not going to just roll up to brothers and be like, oh, can you look after my son while he's in the men's side? Yeah, it's a difficult situation. You didn't have no, like, cousins or anyone that was Muslim at that no. time as well. So my cousin, who is Muslim, doesn't... She's She 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 doesn't really practice to that degree anyway. And she was going through a lot of stuff herself um, with her ex-husband now. Um, so that wasn't even a situation that I could navigate in that way. Um, and even with like sisters that I knew, because I only had a handful of sisters that I knew, I didn't know them like that to be, oh, can you get your husband to? What is the solution for that? Because that's a topic in itself, isn't it? The fact that you have a lot of single mums, you have obviously boys and girls. If there's no father figure in a house like that, especially say he's never a practicing person. I mean, look, one angle is, in terms of establishing communities. So let's say the, the man's not in, there's not a man in the house, but in the community, there is an uncle, meaning not a blood uncle, but you know, he's an elder in the community. It's a brother. He will give support. But sadly, you know what? Uh, maybe we don't operate like communities, but I mean, touching on that sister, did you find like, let's say for masjids or imams, there's not enough support. So sometimes you're left on your own and so on. I didn't really know how to even navigate it, to be honest. So, yeah, I was, I kind of just did what I could. I didn't really know who to reach out to mm. in that sense. I, I must have had like a few conversations about it and then there wasn't really a solution to it. So I kind of just, you know, like I was just feeling my way through it. Like I said, I was learning the Dean for myself and just breaking habits and, you know, situations were happening around me that I was still going through. And so there was a lot that was happening. So it wasn't as simple as just, okay, reach out to someone in the community or even expect that somebody is going to just do X, Y, and Z for me. Yeah. Um, Remember but, what, what, while things are progressing, a lot of Muslims and a lot of Dao, a lot of Shahadas on a negative. Yeah, I mean, and that's not just the Muslims, but the world's become very selfish. So everybody, okay, I've got my family, that's it. It's nafsi, nafsi, myself, mm. myself. Mm. My times, the spare time I have is for my family. I'm not going to give it to anybody else now. So that attitude is also on the increase. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think in terms of like what you said about the community and like we've got in general, like you said, the people are to themselves. And not only that, there's so many things that just happen that there's a lack of trust in leaving your kids with this person and that person there's because you hear stories and so you can't unless you're there yourself in person you kind of feel a bit like well that's maybe not going to happen um and so obviously when I 
when I was married, I was hoping that that would be an avenue for me to kind of get my son a bit more involved Islamically in, in things with brothers and stuff. But again, you know, that's a situation with itself. You're in a marriage, you're trying to get to know that person, that person trying to get to know you. You're, you know, I didn't live with either of my husbands because I have a house and they had their house. So we lived separately and both of those, I lived separately from both those husbands. And so it was, it's just hard to navigate. It's just hard to kind of, you know, know what to do. And then by the time you look at it, it's years later down the line, and now you're like, right, okay, so we're here. What do we do now? Do you know what I mean? Um, with my son being 19, obviously we know that there's certain things happening. The youth violence is on the rise. It's just a mess. And so for me, I know that right now it's this this time of his life. It's, 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 it's fundamental mm. that he kind of is... I was trying to come to get him to come today. <laughs> I was trying to get him to come today. But this is the thing. Once upon a time, I could just say, we're going here. Now, I have to, you know, try and convince you man, to come. Yeah. yeah. He's not a big man. This is the thing about mm, it. Mm. You're far from it. I remember being 19 and thinking, yeah, I'm a big woman out here. Mm. You're not. But I'm going to, you, you've got that autonomy because like you have to, I have to give you the autonomy to make your own choices now. It's just that. And I, all I can do is advise you, like the Prophet Sallallahu said, you know, advise them from the age of 14, advise them. And so right now for me, it's constantly reminding of the deen, constantly like situations will happen. And then I'll be like, this is why maybe if he was wearing a phobe instead of the, you know, you, you don't attract the attention. You know what I mean? Because we know that you don't necessarily have to be involved in certain things. Sometimes you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm not going to act like my son hasn't been in certain situations because he has. And I've been that mum that's been there at like four o'clock in the morning trying to get through to my son. And I don't know where you are. So now I'm calling the police to go and look for you. You know, mm. I, I've been that mum. I've also been that mum that's had to run outside and go and break up something because I could hear the madness happening from indoors and I'm recognising the the tone and I'm recognising the voice mm. and I'm saying, right, oh, what's that? And I'm run outside to go and break up certain situations, put myself in danger because I've had to. Be it's the nature of the situation. Yeah. Um, and again, all I can do is advise because... There's two ways you can do it. You can either start getting angry and end up being this person that's confrontational. And then now they're just not going to tell you nothing. They're not, they're going to keep you at a distance mm. and they're going to go more towards that life. Or you can be that person that's open with them. This is just my opinion as a per parent. And this is just what's worked for me in it because I know my situation. And so being that person as a parent where I'm able to have these conversations with them has worked in my favor because my children will come to me at certain times. I've had to go in that bedroom and I've found certain things and I've had to confiscate it. And I'm then putting it on the kitchen counter and saying, what's this? Mm -hmm. Explain to me. What, what's, ha what's happening? But I could do it the other way and be like, what's going on? What are I'm not going to get very far with that one because I've been in that situation at their age mm. and I know how that works. Mm. So knowing my children, knowing that I could approach it two different ways and get two different results, I'd rather do it this way because this is how, this is what works for me. Being the confrontational mum, again, when we talk about all that whole, you know, what you learned from childhood, that, I don't even want to say toxic masculinity because max masculinity isn't toxic. It's how people behave that's toxic. toxic but it's masculine or feminine. Bringing those kind of masculine traits like to, to, to be, a, be the aggressor is a masculine trait and it doesn't do you any favours as a woman as far as I'm concerned. Other people might say different and that's up to them. But I know that it doesn't work for me. I, I, I tried it. I tried it and then got to a point where I was like, actually, this isn't working. Mm. Actually, I can see the distance happening. Actually, I can see the resentment building in this child. Actually, I can see that if I keep doing that, 
I'm going to push you towards that. So let me not do that. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that's where the difference is. As a man, there's an approach that a man can have with a boy child in that, not say, not necessarily aggressive manner, but that masculine manner and get the message across. Whereas mm. from a woman, it's not going to be received well. Mm. I saw it with my mum and my brothers. Mm. I saw it. I grew up with that. So I wasn't trying to do that. So does he have a good relationship with the pops that he, he guides him? Yeah, he has a good enough relationship. But again, he's not Muslim. So the guidance is going to be a little bit different. You know what I mean? But um, Alhamdulillah, you know, he that all, all of the kids, they are on the path. Sure. They know Islam. And I just continue to encourage them. I just continue to encourage them to do their salah, to read the Quran. Um, my middle daughter, she's the one that's very like on it right now. With she's, you know, she's reading all the books. She's she's doing her GCSEs at the moment as well. So, but she is very, very. I can see where she's going. I can see, inshallah, if you keep yeah. up this level of interest, then inshallah you'll be wearing hijab soon. Because sure. again, that's something I never forced on her. And I never forced it on her because we came from a life where once upon a time you were celebrating Christmas there were, and birthdays and all these things. And so for me, I just felt like I can't push that on you because I'm going to push you towards that. You're going to want to take it off. You're going to be like putting clothes in your bag and running out the door and getting changed and doing all these things. I know how it goes. And there's a big revival now, sister. You don't know, like people looking into Islam. <clears throat> so I think it was... Last Monday, somebody said there's this an American lady, and I, I don't know for how long, but she's been daily or something. Megan Rice, yeah, Megan Rice, reading the Quran, well. and then yeah, she kind of like, so gives an explanation. Funny, and then somebody <laughs> told me yesterday she took shahad. Yeah, she do has. it for the tea, darling. Actually, she's a storyteller. Seriously, <laughs> Allahu Musta'ala. Even I started watching. I'm like, I didn't know about Yusuf like that. You know, like, is she famous from before? No, uh, she's, just lately. she's just, I think she's literally, again, with this whole Palestine, yeah, Palestine lot, situation. You know, yeah, It's got a lot of people interested. Masha Allah. Yeah, yeah. You know, people are really looking at Islam again. But this same thing happened with 9-11, didn't it? Same thing, mm. same thing. And, and this is the, the thing about it. You know, like, we plan, Allah is the best of planners. Because mm. they think they've got their plan. But this is, Allah's bringing people to the deen through this 100%, 100%. thing. 100%. And exposing the real criminals. Exactly. You know? Through what's happening, yeah. I'm I think I've never felt so hopeless in this whole kind of situation like, ever in my life. I never felt like you can't do anything. But the more I've been seeing so many people, one turning out for the protest, and two, so many people looking into Islam because of the faith of the Gazans. Once they start seeing people, because most people in the West, what we're used to is something happens like, why me? There is no God. You know, you go to that side. Whereas yeah. these people are going, running to Allah, even though all of this is happening to them, mm. they're running and saying, Hasbun Allah, Nabi Muhammad, and people are putting the translations underneath, mm. which clearly shows, you know, we will return to Allah and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm patient. And people are seeing that. And, and yeah. the fact that people are seeing that, they're thinking, what kind of religion is this? That people are still holding on to God, even though they're being blown up, they're dying, their mom, everyone's dead. And they're still saying, thanks to Allah. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that little bit is where the hope lies that, you know what, even through all of this, there's massive revival of just people coming to Islam. So even well, those running away from Allah, they plan and Allah plans and Allah's mm. the planners. Mm. So sometimes people are thinking of a negative situation, but Allah through it is reviving the deen. Mm. Right. Like, it's like for everyone dying, there's like hundreds of people coming to it. In, in essence, life. Mm. Islam is giving you life. Your shahada is giving you life. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But sister, you know, you do a, I think it's a podcast, Sister Aisha. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you've got an online presence. Uh, what was the reasoning behind that? Did you just think, okay, I can influence other, you know, ladies, non-Muslim ladies or sisters? What was the idea behind it? It, it actually wasn't my idea. It was Aisha's idea. Yeah. And she invited me to be the co-host. And I think what she wanted to do was really kind of bring the issues that we discuss amongst the sisters into the forefront and kind of highlight them a bit more because certain issues were being highlighted and were being spoken about, still are being spoken about, but not in a manner that kind of 
brings it back to you reflecting on yourself mm-hmm. and like a lot of a lot of you know the time when we see certain things being discussed like you mentioned before there's this back and forth blaming situation going on oh it's the brothers it's the sisters it's but no one's looking at okay but what's going on for you individually are we doing that work so we wanted to kind of take the different topics and bring it back to a point of self-reflection every single time for sisters in particular because there's always going to be somebody giving you advice and we need Nasiha but we as women women know women just like men know men you know and I think we need to be able to have a level of honest conversations without crossing the line do you get what I mean you know crossing the line into um we're now making it about you know coming from a western perspective yeah, yeah. we need to keep it Islamic. Quran and Sunnah yeah, yeah. but we need to discuss what does this actually look like break it down understand it and then have a point of self-reflection because really and truly everything comes back to what are you doing for me you know when I when I was going through a, a that whole healing journey that I mentioned a couple of years ago when around the time my dad died there was an ayah of Quran that kept coming up for me and it was in Surah Al-Arad when Allah says verily we will not change the condition of a people until they change what is within themselves and that Wallahi, I don't even know. Like the way that that ayah kept on coming up in different situations. And it kept on saying to me that I need to look at what what am I doing? What have I done? What is the, what is the impact of certain situations done for me that makes me, you know, behave a certain way, talk a certain way, think a certain way, feel a certain way? What are those things? And then how does that impact the people around me? How do I carry that into the world? You know, um, yeah, I just went on a tangent. No, that's fine. So what are some of the topics that you covered, you, you, you've you covered so far? What's um, it called? What's the name? Is it Sisters? It's called Sister, sister Podcast. Sister Podcast, that's it. Um, sister, Sister Podcast. Sister to Sister. Oh, Sister to Sister. I remember there was a movie called Sister Sister. Yeah, it was a series, yeah. <laughs> um, we spoke about, I think one of the one of the huge topics that we spoke about was Secret Marriages. Yeah, we had we wanted to kind of should have like, brought Imam on. <laughs> he knows a lot about it. We was we was trying to get a conversation with an Imam. I don't know why I didn't message you and ask you to be mm-hmm. fair, but um, the it's trying to get him to trouble this guy. <laughs> <laughs> there was a whole like we did four episodes on that because we wanted to get the sisters' perspective, we wanted to get the brothers' perspective, and we wanted to kind of get a group perspective as well so we had conversation with some individual sisters who had been on the receiving, the receiving end. end of being the, the the secret or being the wife who found out about the secret wife and then we spoke to a couple of brothers who had you know they had secret yeah, wives blurred their faces though yeah did you have we the faces blurred the faces <laughs> yeah we did we blurred the faces was... and we actually like covered their um, Names Their the voices okay, We yeah. disguised their voices Because it wasn't about Calling people out Exactly yeah. It was about Talking about the impact And How it could be done differently And then we had a group conversation With A couple um, You know Tox and Raquel Oh yeah Yeah mashallah. We we got them on And um, Gabriela Romani Okay. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so we had like a group conversation because obviously Gabriel Romani, he's 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 got multiple wives, and Tox has Tox has got two wives. Mm-hmm. So it was we you know we need to have a conversation mm-hmm. where people have actually been in a situation of polygamy and how to actually do how th- how they feel that polygamy works, mm-hmm. you know, or should work. Um, because, yeah, there's always going to be things on their sister's end where jealousy and all these things, but we know that this is the right of the brother. So how do we have to, what do we have to change? What mindset do we have to have to be able to 
be comfortable. Mm -hmm. And then coming from the brothers, what do you need to do to be able to address a situation where your wife is, you know, she's against it from the beginning. She's going to make it difficult for you. Mm -hmm. How do we work with that situation? What can we do Mm -hmm. instead of just then making it a secret? Because then in the end, is it going to benefit anyone? Of course, it's a loss, loss for both people. It's important that look the discussion at least, because remember it's happening. Mm-hmm. So somebody needs to address it, and also from the brother's side now, it's like you know, it's uh, sometimes they feel okay. It might be, it might be even in my case, you know, look, he's against polygamy. It's not against polygamy. It's how you do it. Number one, how did you find, you know, the, the, the sister to marry? Yeah. Did you go through the right channels and the right ways? Yeah. Number two, what rights are you observing? Some cases, it's like. Rights will not be given to the first one. Mm. And you got a second one. Come on, Akhi, what's going on? She's living on, you know what, like you call it benefits. Mm-hmm. You're not even providing. You're not even there. Mm-hmm. Where's the angle of justice going to come into that? Yeah. But it's, a, it's an important discussion. So no, Jazakallah khair for, you know, yeah, with the podcast and bringing up these topics. Yes. I need to tune into that one. Sorry? I need to tune into it. I don't know, you was having those kind of discussions. We don't, we, our imam doesn't have those discussions. This is why like, you're one of those ones that, uh, that's, <laughs> that they screened up. <laughs> those ones, they, they uh, watch I'm an honest man. Huh? My wife knows I'm an honest man. Mashallah. Yeah. Allah. But yeah, now, Barakallah, obviously we've gone way kind of uh, over our, our usual kind of time, but obviously it's been a insightful discussion, especially in the beginning, talking about, you know, um, personal issues, which hopefully many people can benefit from. Inshallah. So, Jazakum Allah for being open about that. And yeah, may Allah reward the works that you're doing and obviously get you more eyes and ears and people to to, to change, inshallah. That's what we're all trying to inshallah. do on these platforms. Any, what we usually ask, is just any last, you know, reminder or something that's personal to you, something that you deem important that maybe others can learn from. Um, and I'm not really big on um, big pieces of advice, I'll be honest. But I think if if there's something that I can say, um, I'll just echo what I've said throughout, which is I feel like our generation, we're, we're in a time now where we've got so much access to information and knowledge mm-hmm. and acquiring Islamic knowledge is important, but it's always also important to acquire knowledge of yourself and understand how to merge the two. I feel like the Prophet ﷺ had a lot of emotional awareness. He had that balance because when we look at all of the hadith, you can see that if you are looking for it. You can see in his relationships with the Sahaba, with his wives, that the Prophet ﷺ was, he was very, you know, emotionally intelligent. Mm. And that reflected in all of his relationships. And so I feel like we need to kind of tap into that more. Mm. Um, stop trying to blame each other for things and look more into how you impact a situation and the people around you. Mm. Yeah, I think similar to that verse that you said with regards to that Allah doesn't change the condition of a people until yeah. they change that which is within themselves. And the more people do that, the more there will be harmony because yeah. you're checking yourself. Umar anu said the same thing, said, Hasabu and Fusukum, that you should check yourself before you're checked by Allah and that you should weigh your deeds before it's weighed. Exactly. And when you have that type of society, then there is no need for blaming because the first person you're thinking of is you anyway. Mm. And so, yeah, but yeah, barakallah for, for, for coming through and yeah, jazakumullah khair and inshallah we'll catch everyone on the next one. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace.